Oh, hi. Hey, this video was sponsored by Squarespace. Thanks, Squarespace. Hi, everyone. So one of the things that I do every year, not necessarily on paper, but at least sort of mentally, is go through what worked in the garden the year before and what didn't so that I have a better idea of what things I want to repeat or what things need a little bit of attention or I need to take a different look at. So I thought instead of just sort of letting this roll around in my brain, I would spew it out to the camera and share with you some of my thoughts, specifically on some of the plants that I grew for the first time this year and um, some of the plants and combinations that were new or different or interesting to me for some reason. Uh, because I thought it might be helpful to you and I do get questions all the time of what did you think about X plant. So I'm gonna start with Senecio Angel Wings. Um, this was a major feature in my garden this year. I bought maybe 15 of them, 12 of them, something like that. Um, it's not an inexpensive plant. Um, it is a form of Dusty Miller with these great broad leaves that are almost white, light gray to white. They, they are truly white or gray flowers or leaves. They have hardly any green to them, so they are really a statement. Now I planted these both in a section of the circle garden as well as in the dahlia border right along the front of the house. They ended up doing very, very well for me in the circle garden. That part of the circle garden worked out really well and I was very happy with how that went. And actually, that Senecio Angel Wings, I think it's hardy to zone seven. Um, it put up, it looked good for a very long time. It's probably just within the past couple of weeks that it really just sort of pooped out and froze out. So it's interesting to me. So if you are in a little bit warmer zone, um, that might be something to really think about because you might be able to keep overwinter that right in the ground maybe. I love the plant. I would be happy to grow it again. I don't think I gave it the best shot where it was. Um, you might be better in a container for me. I don't know, we'll see. Um, it's also not dissimilar to one of my favorite plants that I grow from seed area, with it, which is uh, Salvia argentea, in that that also has kind of a big, bold, silvery leaf, although that is more on the green side, sort of sage green side, than the Senecio is. So, I see a lot of a little bit of overlap in how I might be able to use those in my garden and certainly growing the salvia argentia from seed is a much less expensive option than buying those which were I mean most places were selling those for about 12 bucks a piece it was an investment the next plant as long as I'm thinking about the circle garden that kind of comes to mind is that in one of those sections of the circle garden and I'll just back up briefly to remind you if you guys haven't seen me plant up the circle garden before is I've essentially broken that circle garden into quadrants and each quadrant is broken into three sections. So there are uh, 12, that's how you do the math. There are 12 sections in that garden and I try to mass plant those sections with either one plant or a combination of a couple of plants that tie in together for a bolder look. And one of those sections I tried this year, um, I planted some calendula and I forget which one it was. It was one of the more pastel-y looking ones. It didn't work out great. Um, calendula is such a beautiful flower, but I think it was not well suited to a, a more refined area. I mean, calendula is a little it's a little out there, you know, it wants to look a little wild. It seems like it should be. It didn't really bloom super well for me. It was very hard to, it was kind of floppy. It didn't sort of stay, I didn't really stay on top of the deadheading with it because it was hard to get in there. So I won't do that again. I mean, calendula is great. It just wasn't the right application for it at all. The next one that was new for me last year was this plant jewels of Opar. I planted that um, because I saw it everywhere at Longwood Gardens when I went there in 2019. And uh, Jewels of Opar is so cool. It's uh, like a succulent. It's got these succulent leaves on it that are chartreuse. And it puts up these wiry little stems with tiny, tiny, tiny little flowers on them that are kind of red and pink and purplish. They almost look like little peppercorns on the end of a tiny little wire. And I had been told ahead of time that once you plant Jules Vopar, you will always have Jules Vopar because apparently it is a heavy reseeder. Um, and I knew that going into it, I was okay with that. Um, so I grew it, I actually started it inside, in cells, planted it out. It was so great, I loved it. I also had that in a section of the um, 
of the circle garden and it worked that worked out really well there it just took a little bit to get going it wants i think it wants a lot of heat and of course we have such cool summers here that it takes a while to get to that heat um, but i kind of sprinkled it all over the garden i will not be planting more this year because i'm assuming it will reseed for me um, so we'll see how the reseeding goes, but I thought that was a charming little plant to add to the garden and low growing so you don't have to worry about it you know, taking over somewhere. Um, then on the not so great side, I planted a ton of um, great quaking grass, which is uh, Brisa Maxima. And I started that from seed as well and planted that out and it, didn't do great in the ground at all for me. In one spot, first of all, where it grew, I loved how it looked. It's got these nodding little heads. I am a sucker for movement in the garden and I just love that sort of playful nodding thing. Well, for one thing, the rabbits loved it. They just decimated the stuff that I grew right in front and center of the patio garden, which was a bummer because I kind of had that hole there for the rest of the year and I tried to fill it in with various things, but uh, it was, kind of always there. And then in another spot I grew, it was over by the garage. I like to line a little bit of the path with the same thing over by the garage. So I did that there and uh, it didn't do well. It didn't get enough water over there. I don't water that area really at all. It's kind of, you're on your own over there. And I think it got particularly dry along the path there. So it just sort of dried out quickly, but I kind of liked the dried stems. I thought it looked kind of nice. But it, I mean, the dried stems were better than looking at nothing. I mean, even that flower is beautiful. Grass is even beautiful when it's dry. And so I left them. And in about October, I looked down and that whole area is covered with little grass shoots coming up. So I think I created a total nightmare for myself. I think that thing reseeded, even though it didn't do that well, I think it reseeded all over the place. So I will have to keep an eye on, I mean like all over the place. So I think I may have created a nightmare for myself with that. Now I've talked about the pagoda dogwoods that I planted in the driveway containers about a billion times in videos. So I'm not gonna go into that. You guys know that I swapped out roses in those containers for those pagoda dogwoods. It was a two thumbs up change. Looks so good, they, are, they thrived in those containers. What I think I might do though, is that I've always planted those containers with um, a couple of plants that kind of drape and do the whole thing. And this past year I did, mm, what did I do? I did a uh, variegated licorice plant and something blue. I don't remember what it was. I think I did the lobelia again. It was lobelia and I, I do love that combination. I think this year I'm gonna maybe go just really simple and just plant one flower all in the base. I did see somewhere um, uh, in a, British garden where they had planted, I think at the base of olive trees, it was fleabane, which is these short little like daisy type flowers. They're not my favorite to me. They look, they're a, a little closer to me of looking like weeds in that situation. So, but I might do something like that, like a short little daisy type flower in there, or just one mass planting of something in there and keep that really simple because the trees are beautiful enough to stand on their own, as far as I'm concerned. So speaking of containers, uh, the garage container this year, what I call the trough by the garage, was even though the main plant in it did not perform for me, which was Cissus discolor, that's often called the Rex begonia vine. That's this beautiful shade loving vine with these great leaves on it that are like purple and silver and they're crazy. But the rest of the container was the best, as far as I'm concerned, the best that container has ever looked. So I used in there, I used Plectranthus, and the one I used was called Longwood Silver. I have grown one called Silver Shield before. Silver Shield is far more common, at least in my opinion. And to me, I saw no difference between Longwood Silver and Silver Shield. So whatever the difference was, it wasn't enough to make me go hunt out Longwood Silver again. I'll just do Silver Shield. That plant does so well for me over there. It just, it's very, very good plant. And then I just did begonias in there. I did three of the Bossa Nova series of begonias. And I think those are uh, Bolivians, begonia boliviensis, the ones that have kind of pointy flowers. Um, it looked beautiful. Next, the as long as we're on planters, I'll finish up the last planter, which was the urn in the middle of the garden. This is sort of, to me, the spotlight container of the garden. 
one, because that's what we look at all the time, but two, because it's such a focal point in that garden. Um, it's, it's big, it's tall, it stands above. I plant it so that whatever's in it grows above everything else in the garden. It looks a little out of proportion early in the season before all the plants in that garden get a little taller. It does look like a giant pot on top of a stand. Um, but whatever, I put up with a little bit of awkwardness and now I've got some alliums that come up in front of it that kind of balance that height a little bit. Now, um, as you guys probably know that that urn broke. So I am on the search for a new planter there and I've got some, some good ideas of what's gonna happen there. Probably gonna get a bigger one, which means more plants. And I loved that combination last year. Um, so that was a Tropicana canna in there, actually two that I grew in a separate nursery pot and then sunk the nursery pot into the container and then planted everything else. And then uh, Transcendent Transcendentia uh, Pallida, which is the um, purple heart around that. And I did have some Ogon grass in there too, but it, it got eaten by the purple heart. So that was a waste of, waste of money. Um, such a pretty grass too. Um, so what I loved about it is that it was super simple. And so I think the thing I learned from that container this year was to, that especially if you're gonna put that container in what is a very busy part of the garden, because that garden is part of the garden that I fill up with all kinds of dahlias and there's other things growing in there. It's, it's busy. It is not, it is a riot of color and, a, and highly textured um, to the point where it's too much. I mean, like we're definitely walking the line there. So having that container ultimately be very simple with just the canna and just the, um, and just the purple heart was a really good look. So I won't do that again um, because once again, I don't wanna do the same thing two years in a row but I will keep that in mind and try to keep that container simple because big and simple, I think makes a big statement. And I think that's what's needed in that garden. The last thing I wanna to touch on is vines. I think we're gonna be talking a lot about vines this year because once again, my love of vines is, I find them fascinating to grow and I just get more excited about them every year. You put these little seeds in a pot and you kind of, nothing much happens, nothing much happens, and then it gets hot out, and they go not Like, how is a plant growing that much? If I was gonna stick a camera, a longer exposure camera on any plant, and make like, a, you know, a time-lapse video of it growing, it would be one of those vines, because I swear they can grow like a foot a day. It is unbelievable how much they grow. So, two that stand out for me this year, uh, purple hyacinth bean, that is a, Beautiful vine. It's also a total beast, but that is a beautiful vine. I put that in the window box this year. Lots of people were skeptical about that, and I understand that. It's a wild and crazy vine. It gets big. It got wild and crazy, and I sort of liked it. I mean, by the time you get to the end of summer, that window box looks like the jungle is attached to the side of my house, and I accept that, and I'm okay with that. But a lot of people thought that that hyacinth beam was just a just a disaster in there. I didn't mind it. It's such a pretty plant. The flowers on it are gorgeous and worth, they look very sweet PS kind of to me. Very much worth cutting and doing some of that. Beautiful um, dark purple foliage on that. So while I won't be putting that in the window box this year, I, I probably wanna give some thought about where I can use that because it's just, it's such a good plant and so easy to grow. The other one is, and let's just say this is an all-star, and I think I've talked about it already, um, so I won't go into it too much, but it's purple bell vine, and I'm gonna give you the botanical name for it because a lot of people are getting confused about it, rightfully so, because I keep calling it purple bell, bell vine. So it's um, Rhodochiton, I am looking at a piece of paper, Rhodochiton astrosanguineus is the botanical name on that. It's from Mexico. It has small leaves, these great bell flowers, which are very rude for a period of their development. It is, it's very X-rated. Um, and then they open up to these, to these dangling little, literally they look like bells. They're so cool. Now I grew those in the containers um, on the deck where I have them going up the posts. And what they did was they went to the top of the strings I had and then they started coming back down. Now, if I had extended those strings across the pergola, it would have followed those strings, which is what I should have done. 
But it's good to know when a vine does that because where the purple hyacinth bean like went off in search of something to stick onto, which was in the, in the window box, it attached to the rose trellis near it. It attached to kind of worked its way up underneath the siding of the house in one spot. I mean, it was searching for a place to be. The purple bell vine went up and when it ran out of somewhere to grab onto, it came back down. So there was actually like almost like this waterfall effect. And that's really cool because that means when you grow it in a container, you don't have to worry about it going nuts. It's just going to kind of stick to your trellis and really cover it in flowers. Um, my understanding is that it wants a little bit of shade. And since the one that grew in the shadier part of the deck, just as well as, or even better maybe, as the one that's in the little sunnier spot, I would say that bears it out. I would really love to grow that in the window box this year. I Think it's not going to work. I think the window box, which is self-facing, high, full sun against a white house, is probably going to just cook it to death. So I, as much as I want that to work, I'm probably not going to do that. We'll have to think about that a little bit. In any case, I will grow purple bell vine for a really long time, and I'm sure it'll probably go in these containers again by the deck. Um, but that was such a great performer. So if you're up for trying something new, try that one. Um, we might do some videos planting that. We'll see, but I will just tell you, it's one you have to be patient on. The germination time on it is on the back of the packet. I'm not kidding you. Anytime between 12 and 40 days. So basically you stick it in a pot and then I guess you basically just hope for the best and at some point it pops up. I do think it was all of 40 days. I remember at some point thinking, well, that didn't work. And then it did and it came up. So it's one you got to put your patience pants on for that one because um, it it's, could take a while. And all those tropical annual vines. So most of these annual vines um, that will grow from seed and get to become an enormous plant in one season are tropical. So keep in mind, they don't really start getting going until it gets sunny and, or excuse me, until it gets really warm. My sun helps. Um, but they just sort of poke around and kind of suffer. A lot of them don't love to be transplanted. So um, what I do, because it'd be way too late to start them from seed, I think, to direct sow them into pots. And that wouldn't work with as much as I pack pots full of things. So I do plant them in um, at least four inch pots, not like a little cell. I plant them in like at least four inch pots. Um, hopefully a big enough pot that they can live in there until they get transplanted to wherever they're going. Okay, so that is basically um, all the new stuff or some of the sort of notable things that are going through my head right now as I'm planning out what goes in this year's garden. And of course, I've got seed catalogs coming in like crazy, plant catalogs coming in from crazy, like crazy. And it uh, helps me a lot to just sort of do a little bit of an analysis of how things worked last year before I go nuts and just buy all the things and go, well, what am I going to do now? So a quick shout out to the sponsor of this video, and that is Squarespace. Squarespace gives people a really beautiful and powerful online platform where you can create your own website. And I have in fact created a website on Squarespace uh, three or so years ago when Mr. Much More Patient started his own business. Uh, I hopped onto Squarespace and created his business website for him, which um, I will tell you was key because we got that up and running very quickly. It was very easy to do and it gave him a professional online presence right at the start of his business without having to wait for a web developer or something like that. And then of course it has all the great insights that you need to find out if your website is working for you and who's coming to it and, and really how things are going from that aspect of your business. So you go to Squarespace and you play around with the free trial, check out all the templates, design your website. It's all there and safe for you. And then when you're ready to launch, you're going to get 10% off your first website or domain name as long as you use the code squarespace.com slash the impatient gardener. And then you go from there and you are launched and you are out there ready to go. Thank you, Squarespace, and we will see you soon.